Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Rupert Reed. I'm the Director of Research at Policy Exchange and head of its Livable London unit. Um, I'll shortly introduce you to our panel. Um, but first, a, a quick word on what Livable London is all about and what we aim to achieve. Uh, London's the economic engine of the UK, as we know, um, representing a fifth of GDP and 40% of its economic growth. Um, its continuing success will be essential as Britain leaves the EU. Um, the capital's advantages are many, favourable business conditions, a talented workforce, unrivaled culture and a rich history. They've all conspired to make uh, this one of the greatest cities on earth. Um, most, if not all, of us that live here uh, know that it's a wonderful place. Yet there are questions over uh, the future prosperity of London and its ability to attract and retain talent. Some wonder if there is a threat, not of a loss of access to the single market or the end of free movement, but of worrying trends that point towards a coarsening of life in the nation's capital, that the police are retreating from the streets and that we're becoming less civil to each other. At its most severe, we are seeing the rise of violent crime with a record number of knife-related incidents. Beyond this, however, we also see on our streets a rising tide of incivility. Rough sleeping is increasing in the capital, uh, and that's at odds with what's happening uh, in the nation more broadly. Um, conditions on the roads and, and noise pollution. Some wonder if we're going in, in the wrong direction. Added to this on, are the demands on housing uh, and the pressures on infrastructure. We think that London needs some fresh thinking and to ensure she retains her front rank status. Time and again, cities that endure have renewed themselves and London needs its own solutions. That's why we've launched our Livable London unit. No other organization in Westminster provides a focus akin to the Manhattan Institute in New York. This American project set the benchmark for urban regeneration, showing that it's possible to turn around a city with innovative, practical policies grounded in the reality of citizens' everyday lives. In recent years, the centre-right has led the way on regional development from the Northern Powerhouse to the Midlands Engine. And yet for London, and for Londoners, there has been a lack of focus of late. It is time that that spirit of work is renewed, and the, on the everyday experiences of Londoners, addressing both the big structural, but the small and symbolic challenges that face the capital. So to today's inaugural topic, the balance between the rights of protesters and the rights of Londoners, its businesses, commuters, and residents. In the past few weeks, key routes have been brought to a standstill by protesters. Traffic has been blocked from Parliament Square, Oxford Circus, Marble Arch, and Whitehall. All have been given over at times to 24 hour protest. More than 50 bus routes have been disrupted, affecting an estimated 500,000 commuters. And the DLR to Canary Wharf has been targeted along with parts of the city. Key transport infrastructure has also been taken over including Westminster Bridge, Vauxhall Bridge, Blackfriars Bridge. There have been various threats by protesters closed down Heathrow Airport. So did the authorities get the balance right? Today, we're lucky enough to be joined by an esteemed and expert panel. Uh, they include Lord Blunkett, who is Dave, David Blunkett, served in several cabinets, including as Home Secretary. Sir Mark Rowley, and for, uh, formerly Assistant Commissioner at the Met and uh, former Head of Counter-Terrorism Command. Lord Carlyle, who, uh, amongst many other things, uh, chaired the London Police Policing Ethics Panel. Sonali Prakash, Head of Policy at the uh, Federation of Small Business. And Mike Schwartz, who's a senior consultant at Bindman's Solicitors and has a particular interest in the freedom of expression and freedom of assembly under Articles 10 and 11 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Our speakers will make their opening remarks and then we'll open it to questions. Um, so then to our first speaker, Sonali. Thank you. Um, and it's great to be here to speak to you all today um, on this really important topic. I'm actually going to focus my remarks on the sort of the practical implications of the protests um, and indeed of wider events such as tube strikes or severe weather incidents such as the snowfall that afflicted um, London in 2011 and 2013. You know, really explore what the implications of that are for the wider smaller business community. So first off, I think it's correct to say that there is a direct cost um, which particular sectors are exposed to. So for example, if you're a smaller business operating in the retail sector, in entertainment, in tourism or in transport, um, you are going to be severely affected by the reduction in footfall. 
and also you're going to struggle if your staff cannot get into work. Now, smaller businesses are excellent at offering flexible um, working opportunities to their staff, um, but the reality is they're less likely to utilise the kinds of digital technologies that enable effective working from home. And indeed, for some business models, working from home is not really an effective solution in any instance. Another sector that's going to be particularly affected um, would be that of hauliers, logistic companies and distributors who would find the access through London severely constrained. Just to give you a sense, though, of the sort of the magnitude of the overall effect, um, a couple of years ago, we surveyed our London members on the impact of tube strikes on them, and 58% reported a sort of negative impact. And the kind of key areas that um, they found as real challenges were sort of staff absences, difficulty in the transportation of goods and having to cancel meetings. But of course, it's not just about the direct impact on particular sectors. There's also a wider indirect opportunity cost, if you will, that afflicts the wider smaller business community. So for example, um, the diversion of police resources has a real impact upon business crime. And that's a huge issue for our members right now up and down the country. When we've surveyed on this topic a few years ago, between 2014 to 15, almost 50% of our members had been um, the victim of some form of non-cyber related crime, so theft, vandalism, antisocial um, behaviour, burglary, um, and the average unit cost of one of those instances for a smaller business came up to around £6,000. So what do we want to see? Um, well, we really want smaller businesses to be supported to build up their resilience, um, to cope with uh, low likelihood but high impact events um, and to give them the resilience they need to help them to overcome their vulnerability because of their lack of resources to really deal effectively with shocks to economic activity. So firstly, we think that supply chains have a really important role to play. Larger customers supporting smaller suppliers to develop effective business continuity plans and contingency plans could be a real game changer and arguably more effective than simply putting a stipulation of an ISO certification into a supplier contract. Secondly, the public sector also has an incredibly important role to play. We've received some really positive feedback about the role of the cross-sector safety communications network that's been put in place um, in relation to the recent protests and passing that information through to organisations like us to disseminate to our wider membership. But we want the government and local government to think about doing more. For example, what about a temporary suspension of business rates for severely affected businesses? And the utility companies, um, the regulated utilities, um, water and energy also potentially have a role to play in terms of giving a bit more flexibility to help smaller businesses to bolster their cash flow during difficult times. And finally, insurance is very important part of the picture and of course it's not just about physical damage it's also about non-damage business disruption and we really want to see smaller businesses have the option of almost taking out um, in the short term a, a kind of booster option um, that enables them to cover some of the costs as a result of the uh, experiencing low likelihood but high impact events. Thank you. Lord Blunkett. Well, firstly, I, just picking up a remark you made, Rupert, I just want to make it clear that I'm not right of centre. Um, <laughs> although where that lies anymore, I'm not entirely sure. I should, I should um, have said we have a cross party. Thank you very um, much. Very good. Uh, I want to separate out two things. Firstly, the worth, worthiness of the cause and how people respond to the cause that's being espoused when people take to the streets and how they take to the streets from whether you can justify one set of actions that cause uh, undoubted material damage from another that provides you with a, a visual and obvious damage. And this is not just true of this issue, it's the way in which people look at cybercrime and the way they look at uh, the, the intrusion into other people's privacy or into espionage and whether it's really not like putting a brick through a window and putting your hand in and pulling someone else's goods out but it's slightly benign and it's after all a bit different and we, we should be comfortable with it. So firstly the cause that was being espoused in April in my view was extremely worthy and the Climate Change Committee report last week underlined that. Uh, what it didn't do of course was to go into fantasy land and believe that you could make completely impossible demands 
knowing that those demands could not be met because you cannot, you could not uh, achieve what they were talking about in six years without closing down the country. Uh, but the cause itself was, was worthy. So was the tactic therefore justifiable, even if it did prevent half a million people getting to work, even if it perversely massively increased pollution in the areas affected uh, and uh, inc not only inconvenience but caused people to use other methods like taxis, uh, even if it did actually disrupt and in the case of DLR, stop public transport working, when you're preaching that you want to reduce climate change, you want to get uh, uh, vehicles to emit less uh, pollution, and you want people to use uh, effective and modern, uh, environmentally friendly public transport. And I think we just need to be clear. When people step over the line from protesting, into completely disrupting the lives of others, causing them genuine, if not visible, harm, uh, making their lives a misery. They're not only perversely turning ordinary working people off, I don't mean the people who were partying, many of whom could take time out as lecturers from universities or students at university, or just people who could, to pick up your point, work from home, even if it was Oxford Circus or Marble Arch for the sake of the moment. In the real world, people can't do that. Other people can't do it. And would you tolerate it? And I don't think we would. I think if people were not on a cause that uh, was sympathetically viewed by what you might call the, the, the enlightened, then people would have demanded much more immediate action and much more decisive action. The police were not in a position to do that, firstly because in the past, the Occupy the Streets have had a different kind of tactic, which hasn't directly uh, affected the populace as a whole and closed parts of London down. But secondly, because, as Mark will undoubtedly underline, if you haven't got the resources, you can't do it. And if the resources have been taken away... In circumstances, when I was Home Secretary, I would have wanted the police to have acted very quickly to stop the blockages to gently, as they did, lift people from uh, blocking the streets and causing other people's lives to be made of misery. And I would have insisted that if they continue to do so, that we should have moved in and we should have had methods of uh, ascertaining their uh, profile, their um, uh, address and who they were, and we should have prosecuted hundreds of people for causing other people's lives to be a misery. And I have good political historical cause on my part. I've just been reading Francis Wien's wonderful biography of Karl Marx. It's both funny and entertaining, as well as informative. I, I was picturing in Oxford Circus, Michael, Buchan, uh, Michael Bakunin arguing with Marx. Bakunin, the forerunner to Trotsky, uh, the uh, uh, forerunner to anarcho-syndicalism, arguing with Marx. And Marx would have said this, as Lenin once put it, is infantile and silly and will actually undermine our cause. And Bakunin would have said, but it causes havoc, and havoc in itself therefore has a beneficial outcome. I would suggest that the Make Poverty History campaign, 2004-2005, was much more effective damaged no one, persuaded world leaders on the issues of debt redemption for sub-Saharan Africa and the beginnings of the proper climate change debate through to today. And that kind of campaign has long-term benefits, whereas undermining the, the well-being and the rights of the rest of the population in the name of something that you've espoused doesn't, because one day the cause will not be won in which uh, civil rights lawyers will feel comfortable. And then what will they say? Thank you very much, David. Um, Lord Kalal. Um, first of all, can I apologise for the fact that I will disappear just before 20 to 7. I told Policy Exchange I had to be at another event at 7 o'clock, and I will have to be. So excuse me and don't think me rude. Um, I, I live in the London Borough of Hackney, 
and I, I have in a very nice part of Hackney, and I have some concerns about the neighbourhood policing that we see in the borough. And I accept, by the way, Mark, wherever he is, counter-terrorism policing from this, because I think it's been done very well on the whole. I witnessed a crime recently in the middle of the night outside my house in which a cyclist with a baseball bat smashed off the wing mirror of an expensive hire car in which my wife was about to be taken to an airport. And I dialed 999, and within five minutes, very creditable, a police car turned up with two officers in it. And the first thing that the police officer said to the man who owned the car was, I've got to manage your expectations, sir. Now, you know, I think it's a pity that we're in a situation in policing now where so much managing of expectations takes place. And this does translate into what's happened in the last week. Um, when I was young, about 50 years ago, well, maybe even slightly more than that, I used to march up and down Whitehall for various causes. I won't tell you what they were. Some were respectable, some were not. I think one involved supporting Rudy Dutchka and Daniel Cohn Bendit, if anyone can remember who they were. Um, and uh, it was a right which I wanted to assert, and I absolutely stand by the right to protest. Um, there is a right to protest. It's sort of enshrined in the European Convention on Human Rights and the Human Rights Act and I would support it to the hilt. But I'm very disturbed by what happened last week. Um, I've always believed, as a large L liberal, uh, but no longer a liberal Democrat, certainly as a social Democrat, that we have a lot of rights and we're right to claim every one of those rights. But I also believe in the principle that when you assert a right, you accept a, a, a raft of duties as well. And I think that protesters, even when they have a very legitimate issue behind their protest, must understand and must accept that they too have duties to the rest of the community. Um, the um, Public Order Act uh, 1986 sets out, uh, as amended, sets out what the police can do in an attempt, it may not always be successful, to control uh, demonstrations and marches that are going to take place and of which the police have the right to be notified and of which they can take certain action in advance. In the case of last week's events, the result was, as uh, David has said, that roads were blocked, um, people were not able to go about their business, um, the event was supported by a very distinguished female actor who flew 5,200 miles in a jet aircraft to speak at the event. 10,200 Metropolitan Police officers were deployed and 350 officers were deployed from outside London, no doubt enjoying their fish and chips and hot dogs and ice creams because they have to be fed from vans in which diesel is running all the time they're sitting in the streets. So the uh, carbon footprint of what happened last week is not very respectable. I believe that there are measures, if they're taken promptly, as David Blunkett suggested they should be, which could um, uh, limit the obstructivism of those who cause such protests. I believe that meaningful protests can be made in meaningful places in this city and elsewhere in the UK without obstructing the lives of citizens. I do not think that blocking the ability of children to go to school or of old people to get on public transport to reach day centres like the House of Lords um, is something that we should um, allow where there is an alternative. And there are alternatives. Uh, Parliament Square, I would actually turn Parliament Square into a pedestrian only area anyway, but that's got nothing to do with this issue. Maybe a consequence of moving the House of Commons and the House of Lords for 20 or 30 years. Um, but I believe that the police have measures which they should be entitled to take and expected by citizens to take so that the life of London can go on. And I do not believe that the voice of the protester would be lost in any significant way. And I think one of the things that Policy Exchange's Livable London protest should be doing and will do mm. is trying to ensure that there is a balance between that very important right of protest and the right of the rest of the citizenry 
to go about their everyday lives, earn their wages. Many people are hourly paid these days, earn their hourly rates and um, live in London in an undisturbed way whilst seeing those protests. And I hope that this will be one of the major themes of your project. Thank you, Alex. Um, Mike. Um, I seem to be in the minority then. Um, so let me put the case for um, the issue and the right to protest. Not long on the issue, longer on the right to protest. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I was struck by the title Liverpool London. So I, I Googled it and one of the first things that came up was a headline from the London Evening Standard that said, this is from last summer, Londoners face floods, droughts and blackouts by 2050 caused by the effects of climate change. And that, I think, is the, the wider context, which we're, I think we're all aware of, but may be lost when one's looking at the detail about uh, obstruction for a few days or a few weeks in limited areas on an issue where, in the view of a large number of people, I won't say minority or majority, but a large number of people think that business as usual is failing the climate, and therefore all of us, and therefore there needs to be radical change and not only the business as usual, but the constitution as usual is failing to address that. And we're on the trajectory which the London Evening Standard has described. That's the wider context, as many see it, for the reasons for taking protest. But my title here is to talk about the right to protest. So I'll deal with that now, because you don't want to hear me banging on anymore about the impacts of climate change. And there is a danger, and I've seen it in the, in the press at the time, and there are dangers of it being echoed, that at best uh, protest will be seen as something to tolerate, to put up with. And at worst, it's wrong, and in the, in the uh, words of another uh, Home Secretary, it needs to be stamped out with the full force of the law. And there's that danger that a knee-jerk reaction will be taken to these protests, and further, that the lack of resources which the police had to, in their eyes, tackle this problem will be translated into laws which will further erode the right of peaceful protest. And that may be the next thing on the, the legislative agenda when it comes to protest. So I'm going to make four points, and they're fairly well known, but just to remind ourselves of the context, four points about the importance of the right to protest. The first is it's a form of self-expression. People have political views and religious beliefs and so on, and they are entitled in a liberal democracy to express those views and express it with people who share their views. That's the first point, and it's a fundamental right because it's what, what we are. We're not just consumers, we're not just politicians, we're not just lawyers and police officers. We're with humans with, with views and with feelings and with emotions and politics, and that's what expression is all about and assembly is all about. That's the first point. The second is the reason to protest, or one of them, is to get one's message across to other people through the media and through the media to the public. And it's worth bearing in mind, and I think this is a, the context, that protesters on many issues don't have privileged access to the media. They can't phone up editors to express their views. They don't own newspapers or other media outlets. Their only form of protest or to express their views is a very democratic one, which is to gather with other people and to express their views in a sense of solidarity because they're excluded from the, the privileged form of expression, which is the media or the old style media. So that's the second point. They have to express, and they feel the need to express their views to other people. The third is this, that through this, the fact of the process of the media through the public, they are trying to affect the decisions of decision makers. And that's people in government, people in business, people in power. And again, it's the democratic point that many people who take to the streets don't have those privileged forms of protest and access to persuade those who need to be persuaded. They're not, for example, lobbyists. They don't have the funding to bombard people with uh, the decision makers with their views. They don't go through the revolving doors of government to business or business to government. They have to do it in the most democratic, <coughs> grassroots and open way of, and perhaps the only way available to them, which is public protest, the third point. And the fourth really is the, the sort of constitutional point, and I give way to other 
much more uh, erudite constitutional experts than I am. But there is the point about democracy and free flow of information and the market of ideas. And it's through expression, through putting forward views robustly sometimes that one gets the good things and the bad things. If you've got a bad idea, it'll get found out. If you've got a good idea, hopefully it'll make progress. And you see that with, and these are trite comments, but they need to be made. Things like slavery and the suffragettes. Those ideas flourished, whereas other ones dwindled. And it's a way of furthering a blossoming democracy for people to be able to express their views and influence decisions. And so what does that mean in practice? That means in practice that the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 10, Expression, Article 11, Assembly, and the courts have endorsed these views. For the right to protest to be effective, it has to, in some cases, offend and shock. In some cases, it needs to be disruptive. It needs to be often near the site of the problem you're addressing. It's no good going off to some field in Essex, not that I've got anything against Essex or fields, but if you're protesting about democracy, you should be able to do it at the seat of democracy. There are positive obligations on the state in uh, limited circumstances to facilitate protest, and some would argue, though it's not accepted, that the rights of protesters are as important as those who want to use the streets day in, day out for their ordinary commercial, non-political reasons. So that's what the right needs to be, needs to contain. And there's a danger that those fundamental contents of the rights will be eroded by the reaction, the short-term and in some eyes short-sighted reaction to the protests. And so, like all good history essays, as I was taught by my history teacher, I'm going to end with a quote, and it's a short one, so don't yawn too much. It's a quote that says this. Civil disobedience on conscientious grounds has a long and honourable history in this country. People who break the law to affirm their belief in the injustice of a law or government action are sometimes vindicated by history. The suffragettes are an example. It is the mark of a civilised community that it can accommodate protests and demonstrations of this kind. And these are the words of Lord Hoffman in the case of Margaret Jones in the House of Lords some 13 years ago. And that set the framework, the background, to one's interpretation as lawyers, as police officers, as politicians, to people who are expressing their views through protest. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's perhaps illustrative of the problem overall that um, I'm sat here as a sort of recently former police officer, um, sat between two lawyers with very different views. And, and that's where the police often find themselves on these issues. Um, I'm not going to sort of suggest that the Met got this right or got this wrong. Um, I wasn't sat in the room with the information they had at the time. Um, but I have dealt with these decisions in the past, and I want to talk about some of the practicalities, the legal and operational practicalities, that if we want a different approach to livable London, where perhaps there's a more deliberate strategic thinking about how much should, how should we limit, if, it, if it's at all appropriate, protest in the capital in a way that... Um, maintains people's freedom of movement and helps businesses flourish and things, then, then these are the issues that need addressing. Um, just to finish that sort of comment about stuck between lawyers, I, I once made some decisions on a protest which was um, a fairly sort of um, unpleasant sort of right-wing group, but the, the, the merits of the cause don't really matter. Well, I was actually judicially reviewed three times in three days leading up to the protest. Um, twice by the protest group and once by the local council. One side thought I was being too tough, the other side thought I was being too lenient. And it could easily have been these two gentlemen on either side, but I don't think, but I don't think it was. Um, the judge said, get, get out of the way and let the police get on with it, and was very supportive, which was very welcome. This is, I think, possibly the most difficult and in some ways the most inadequate area of legislation for police to wrestle with. I think Parliament has in some ways um, fudged the issue and left policing with an almost unmanageable amount of greyness to deal with. I'll explain that. So if I punch uh, Alex on the nose and he gets a nosebleed, the law is very clear what an assault is and what it isn't and there's a nice black and white line that one has crossed. The black and white lines in public order legislation in this sort of territory aren't there because we have two competing sets of legislation. We have the, 
and um, Public Order Act from 1986, which has been amended, um, I think, 29 times with 90 different amendments over the sort of uh, uh, since then, um, which is set in a different time, a different context that creates some abilities to constrain and manage protest. Um, then we've got the more recent Human Rights Act and the uh, uh, the freedoms and and uh, that. that um, bestows on everybody and the consequent duties that fall on the police to sort of to support those freedoms that leaves in an issue like this the police there's not a code of practice there's not a rule book stuck between two sort of competing principles this is particularly difficult this case because there are several criteria upon which um, conditions can be put on um, protests and marches um, uh, for example, uh, the threat of serious public disorder or serious damage to property. Those are, again, sort of quite black and white issues. There either is going to be, a sort of, you, you either have intelligence about violence or about damage, or you don't. Um, and what damage is and what violence and what public disorder are is fairly fairly clear. This was a very peaceful sort of protest. There was, I don't think anyone would say those things were sort of really um, major issues. The third criterion is um, about serious disruption to the life of the community. Now, what is the definition of serious disruption, you may ask, and I wish I would say, I don't know, I don't think it's defined, it's something that's been um, a little debated, I think, in court, but not, not desperately. So the police are left in this position of, what do we anticipate happening, and is that serious disruption? And if the disruption is, no worse than a tube strike, or perhaps not as bad as a tube strike, or no worse than a heavy snowfall for a couple of days, does that mean it's a serious disruption or does that mean it's reasonable? And I think those are almost impossible decisions to answer. Now, if there was a code of practice, if parliamentarians had leant forward and put guidance, if there was some rule set around this, then the police would have a, have a framework. That doesn't exist and that makes it particularly, um, particularly tricky. So my first point is about that balance and um, the challenges of, 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 of achieving that. And of course, making that in advance, you need an evidence picture that illustrates that. Now, certainly I've dealt with cases in the past where um, even after an event, um, industry has been reluctant to put, put words on paper and put statements in because even though there's been big commercial damage to them because of a protest that has caused massive disruption, um, they don't want to publicise that degree of commercial damage. So um, can you get the evidence? Uh, it's very challenging. The, the, the rules around those organising the protest are quite tricky. Um, their duties are quite limited um, and they get advice from lawyers telling them how to do the bare minimum to make the police's job as hard as possible. So they'll tell them about a protest but um, be as unhelpful as possible in every other respect. So if the police do put conditions on, they won't share them with any of the protesters because they know the police have to prove that the protesters prosecuted knew what the conditions were um, so there's a whole range of sort of practicalities around it which are I think poorly um, poorly dealt with um, in the legislation but you and then there's the the final practicality of course if you want to um, police against uh, a massive march against its will to sort of to you're not going to protest over here you're going to do it over there we limit the time scale the amount of resources are enormous, and those resources come from community policing, they come from gang, gang intervention teams, they come from a whole range of other functions, and that's, that's one of the things that would always be weighing on a, a, on a, a commissioner's or assistant commissioner's mind. So my, um, my thought on this is, it's, it's easy to sort of stand on the sidelines and, and criticise, and I, I wouldn't do that. But if we want to do something different for the future, there are two things that need sorting out. There needs to be a sort of a review of the legislation about whether it's fit for purpose for the challenges of today. And some of that is about, some of that's the practical tactical challenges. Some of that's the principal point about, can we be clear of what the right balance is between um, freedom to protest and disruption of a city's life? Um, and uh, secondly, I think London, um, it could be City Hall, could be some, 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 uh, some other institution, needs to think about how does it start to collect meaningful evidence on the scale of disruption caused by protests. Because unless you can give the police really concrete evidence that shows actually once, 
once you have a protest of this scale or this nature, it tips past the point in terms of cost or disruptions to people's lives that looks unreasonable. Unless we've got that evidence on the table, the police are really not able to leap forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lord Carlisle uh, did tell us before um, that he's going to have to uh, go early, and he's very gracious to lend his expertise. Has anybody before he dashes got one quick question for him before he goes? If not, we'll allow him to go and open it up. Three, two, one. Thank you very I should have said at the outset, actually, this is the room apparently where Theresa May launched a leadership bid, which oh, probably bodes well for the short term if uh, <laughs> we'll see how the Liverpool London project goes after that. Um, right, we're going to go to a Q&A. First of all, thank you very much to our panel. Um, and uh, there is only really one house rule, which is there's no question too outrageous. Uh, you just have to state your name and organisation. Um, so if we uh, go to questions. One Richard here. Name and organisation. Okay, um, We've got a mic coming just there. Um, Richard Walton, I'm a former police officer and um, I'm also uh, work with Policy Exchange. I just, um, I just wonder whether there's also a sort of creeping decriminalisation going on as a result of a lack of police resources. Um, on the way here I walked past I think five people begging a criminal offence. Um, I walked past people um, attaching uh, banners to, to the House of Commons railings. Uh, there's a bylaw against that. I walked past people who were um, selling food, uh, and and I just wonder whether because we've now got so m the, the numbers of police officers are so few that what we've now got is, is that offences are not actually being enforced. Um, you know, we read that it's you know it's almost uh, passed by if someone's got possession of cannabis. And we solved all this with the neighbourhood policing uh, project that rolled out police officers across the streets of London. We had on every single ward in London a sergeant, two police, officers, police constables and three PCSOs. And it was nothing short of a revolution over two years, a revolution of reduction of crime and a reduction of incivility and everything else. And, and in my 30-year career, I've never seen uh, a policy as impactful as that. Um, and yet we've reversed that policy effectively by denuding the police resources to such an extent that we've now got, as I say, we've got a broken windows problem um, and we've got no one to enforce it. And when you don't deal with the small stuff, as we know, uh, the big stuff doesn't get dealt with properly either and it grows uh, like a defection. So the point is, it, is it that we've, because of the, the, the reduction in police numbers, we've got now a decriminalisation of low-level offences which has impacted as well some of the mentality and some of the ethos of the policing of this event as well. It's brilliant, thank you. Wh who wants to respond to that? Maybe Mark and David? So I, I think resources will obviously be increasingly in um, senior officers' minds given the levels and that will be a factor in it. I, I would add something to what you said, Richard, in terms of the resource percentage is significant, but it's, the problem is much more acute than that because the mix of crime has changed so much. So. Uh, since 2011-12, um, rape and serious sexual offending reporting in the country, um, I think post Savile and those cases, which really raised the profile of it, the massive underreporting is slowly reducing, and I think they've gone up like 25% a year. Um, so it's I think getting close to sort of, it's well over doubled, maybe even tripled over that period of time. That's fantastic. That's more co confidence of victims, but those are complex offences drawing large numbers of officers into that specialist environment. The terrorist threat has drawn more officers into that environment. And then thirdly, um, the burgeoning of cybercrime is a sort of massive challenge to the policing. So it's, it's not just a reduction in budgets and headcounts. Actually, there are some serious crime types which has drawn more resources there. And what that has meant is the resources um, in neighbourhood policing have been sort of doubly, um, doubly constrained. And, and, that, and that means that, um, and I've been sort of Chief Council Assistant Commissioner, you don't like making those choices, but you have to make policy choices on, if, you, if you're spreading your resources thinner and thinner, you have to make choices about what you're going to do and what you're not going to do, and you do it based on, based on the law, based on operational judgment, and um, uh, based on priorities set with um, sort of political overseers. Um, but fundamentally, there's less to go around, and that is part of the challenge. 
anybody else on the panel want to? I only to say I think we constantly come back to um, the balance on on definition of what constitutes an offence, how offensive it is, and in tackling it, do you really undermine the civil rights of and human rights of those who are perpetrating it, not for personal gain, but for what they believe to be a justifiable cause. And I think it's extremely difficult to do this. I, it, when Mark, you talked about legislating, don't let's legislate now, because when you legislate on the back of something, you inevitably get it wrong. So we need to think about this in the long term, as we have done recently with updating the laws in relation to uh, counter-terrorism and although people could disagree with them the the uh, draft legislation the joint committee overlooking it the bringing it back through the two houses the willingness to compromise was a good example of democracy working but at the moment there wouldn't be a a spirit well there's not a spirit for doing anything at the moment um, <laughs> as you know but there wouldn't be a spirit for having a good long look. So maybe policy exchange could help us, but from the presumption that the right to protest is inalienable and exists, the right of people to be able to go about their business and not to have damage done to them that is so indefinable that it's difficult because you've not been punched on the nose, uh, and to be able to do so with a policing system that is genuinely community-based and people think he's on their side. I mean, I'm very proud of those neighbourhood um, co co community measures and the introduction of CSOs and the rest of it, because I did think it got down to that level into the community. But of course, this time, one thing was different. The protesters were nice and were middle class and were pleasant to the police and said, please arrest me. And some of them were prepared to take the consequences if uh, serious action had been taken. Others, I think, were out for a party. Well, that's fine. But, you know, in the end, there are consequences down the line for all of us because we have to weigh up not just whether action is effective in its own terms, in the, in the terms it's laid out to achieve a particular goal, or it, not even whether it's alienated people from that goal by the, the measures that have been taken so that people are more disgruntled about it than they would have been before. But actually, in the end, has the offence been so offensive that we have to take legal measures to deal with it? Anyone else on the panel? I was just going to um, bring it back to protest. And um, this might not be a popular comment, but my sense is that protest is over-policed. And I say that because of this, that one of the principal roles of government and the police is to maintain order and the appearance of order and therefore the most direct in-your-face threat to that, in some people's eyes, is public disorder. And that's why a priority is often to deal with protest. It's also a good way of increasing statistics about crimes solving, because many people are open and peaceful. But in this last two weeks, three weeks, people were arrested for offences that are non-imprisonable. Even if convicted, no one goes to prison. And yet, a thousand plus people were arrested and taken to a police station and kept sometimes for 12 hours for interview, some released at the end of the day. Perhaps it was a deliberate, perhaps it was just a resource led or resource starved reflection of the policing. But was that a, a proper way of policing when we all know that behind doors, domestic business elsewhere, much more serious offences are taking place. And perhaps because they don't get the profile and they're not seen as a political threat to order, they don't get the attention they, they really need. Whereas obstruction of the highway, it's no big deal in terms of penalty. That's not my words, that's, that's the Highways Act's words. Super. Lady there. Uh, Judith Mayhew Jonas, for former leader of the city and chair, former chairman of the New West End Company, where Mark and I used to deal with marches every Saturday and Sunday, if we were lucky. Yes. Friday, Saturday and Sunday, if we were unlucky. Um, I think there's a broader issue here. I think London is um, on the crest of the wave. We all 
remember reading about you know, the renaissance of London, the regeneration of London, the economic development of London, the success of London becoming a global powerhouse. I think we're in danger of losing it, quite frankly. It is the economic powerhouse for the UK, and given our current political circumstances, we lose what it produces at our peril, quite frankly. So there's an important issue about the draining away from London. People are now much more mobile. Capital is, mo is mobile. Jobs are mobile. In the old days, you had to be here because it was London and the job was here, the money was here, whatever. People don't have, people can choose where they work. People can choose where they live. The wealth creators can choose whether they stay or whether they don't. And if London becomes too unlivable, it will go into decline again. Now, I am a lawyer. I used to teach human rights. I was a constitutional lawyer way back in the dim days. And I agree, the right to protest is an important part of democracy. But it, it has to be counterbalanced with the duty to, to the rest of the community. And the tipping point comes very quickly. And I, I think there are two possible things to look at here. It's not just protest. It's framed in the form of a question. Yes, for the it's panel. not just protest. It's also about events. London is becoming a sort of theme park and circus as well. Now, Mark, when we were dealing with the fact that people suddenly decided they didn't want to go on the usual old political march down to Parliament Square, they suddenly discovered the West End and they got much more traction if they beat up the West End on their way to Parliament. And we started to look at the economic analysis of what that was doing, family days out shopping. And you came up with a thought, and it was just a thought, about whether we should have some sort of commission, as they do in Northern Ireland, to examine whether people should have the right to protest and an independent group would judge and balance the rights of all. Do you still have thoughts about that? I'd forgotten we'd had that conversation, but um, it has come to mind again in this context for me. And if you're going to have if Parliament can't come up with a specific framework, you're going to have these two balancing competing rights, which seems likely. I'm not sure the police in the middle of it on their own are really the ones to exert that balance. On the disruption, I think on, on violence and damage and things, that's much more straightforward and black and white. I think on disruption, it's such a subtle issue about what do we value as a, as a city and what, what, what does the law say, um, what's the economic impact, what's the social impact. I think a group of people doing that, whether it's a formal commission, whether it's a board chaired I know, with the business improvement districts or chaired from City Hall or something that actually collects the evidence and builds that sort of that 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 um, that that basis for decision making, it could be it could be either. But I I do think if we really want to change the balance, saying to the police, have this flexible framework on an every individual case, try and balance all these issues up. I just don't think that's that's never going to give a strategic answer to London's issues, which is what you're asking for. Super. We've got 10 minutes left. So if I take a couple of questions at once, mm -hmm. uh, lady at the back in red and the gentleman in glasses. Hi, um, my name's Naomi McGill. I'm writing a book called Galvanize on Global Agile Strategy. Um, you know, th this topic is very passionate for me. A couple of months ago when I was here for writing the book, I actually personally got attacked and um, I uh, was attacked with a karate chop to my neck. I ended up with whiplash, you know, all of those kind of things. And the police were <coughs> unable to respond for it for a couple of months until, you know, I raised it several times. So uh, I know what this experience feels like for an individual. Two weeks ago when I tried to cross London, I was unable to do that in a taxi and I was starting to think to myself, mm, how's the grandmother test going to work out on this situation? First day, you know, the offices of Shell were smashed. I would say that that wasn't peaceful. Um, but the thing that got me thinking about all of this was if my grandmother was having a heart attack, I couldn't get her to the hospital. And that is the measure, I think, of a livable city, is 
how quickly can I respond and get my grandmother who needs care and attention to a hospital? So that stuff went on for weeks and I interviewed multiple taxis. I spoke to lots of people. I was unable to access businesses which I needed to do for my design company. I had to fly back to Australia, wait it out, come back here, and still the protesters were impacting those abilities. So w when you're looking for evidence and all of those kind of things, how many people died in those three weeks with the inability to get to the hospital on time. And that's kind of the question that I would like people to start thinking and asking about, because that's the statistic that really counts. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Alex Turk. I'm from ICM, the Polling and Public Opinion Agency. Um, firstly, thank you for a fascinating conversation. I guess my my kind of question is a bit more, bit more broad and kind of builds on the point made earlier and actually considering this is kind of launching launching a, a project around London being livable and being a livable city is to what extent do issues of protest actually matter in the grand scheme of things when it comes to livability and I guess in the context of tonight's conversation um, my kind of bone of contention I guess for the panel to consider would be isn't it actually to do with the perceptions of, of crime, of public order, yes, but quite often more of crime, maybe reasons why people don't feel safe travelling back late at night on public transport, maybe won't go into their town centre to shop because of fear of being attacked, or that fear of, fear of crime. And to what extent is, is actually protest important in this, or would it be, is there a greater impact elsewhere, at least in the kind of policing and criminal sphere? Lovely, thank you. Right, we've got two there: the the grandmother test and um, perception rather than reality. Um, does anybody want to come in in particular on either of those? Should I Mike, comment on the, on the grandmother test? I mean, should, I mean, obviously, it's it's terrible to hear what happened to you. The and I'm not here to speak on behalf of the protesters, but I think what they might say is that they're their wits end with business as usual with the government, with business, with the addiction to carbon. And they've tried, and others have tried, <coughs> conventional ways of protest to try and change the trajectory. And that's why so many people from so many diverse backgrounds, many grandmothers and people from who would sympathise entirely and have apologised for the disruption caused, would understand and try to reach out to you. But I think that... The, they would see the wider picture, both globally and in the future, for the grandchildren or the children, which is the impact, the devastating impacts of climate change if we continue on the current trajectory. And there are people dying, not getting to hospitals, not having hospitals at the moment. And it's only going to get worse unless there's radical change. And f on one view, this is an expression of, a, of another personal story but m on multiple levels with multiple individuals in mind, which is we have to change in order to stop things getting so much worse. And it, we can all come with very strong personal stories, and I don't doubt yours, but there are other personal stories that can be put forward along those lines. You raise Mark. points on the, the merits of the cause. I think one of the important things to stress from a policing perspective, the sort of arguable moral... Um, uh, rightness or not of the cause being protested on is irrelevant because if the if the police were to start to sort of act the law sort of enact the law Absolutely. differently based on their own judgment as to the sort of worthiness of the cause then that's a that's a very dangerous road to go anywhere near so so um, so we wouldn't go there um, I think sort of what you're articulating and uh, sort of your um, your case seems very very sad and very unfortunate. What you're articulating in terms of a test sort of goes to my point, what is the test? Now, we have big disruptions in London. Um, we have um, the London Marathon. We have, uh, I know, the, the Pride March. Big events that sort of have massive disruptive effect on the centre of London that Transport for London, NHS, Ambulance Service are able to come up with plans and work around. Mm -hmm. And sort of, so... Uh, I think all of that, and that's why that's why this is so complicated. And I, I don't know what the data would show under that. I know um, I know the Met were last week, sort of talking to the last couple of weeks, talking to businesses regularly, looking for any evidence at all, trying to understand 
um, how disruptive is this? What's the impact of it? Has it? Is there a body of evidence which says actually now is the point we should intervene and say enough is enough? Um, so they were doing that piece of work. But that comes back to my point and, and Judith's question about um, praise commission. We're asking we're not, to ask the police to say do an assessment of what's the impact on the health service, what's the impact on small businesses, what's the impact on police businesses, what's the impact on London's attracting Mr. Torres. Well, I mean, sort of, it's a it's a fairly, I think, unrealistic ask of the police, which is why I do wonder whether something a bit more independent uh, who can focus on that question alone would be right and then wrestle with in the capital city, which is so, it's it's the seat of democracy, so it's such a dynamic city, city, it's got so many issues, it's got so many businesses and all the tourism. Actually finding the right balance in that context is a wider question than just say to the police in the middle sort of town. Does anybody else want to come in on that? David Sonali. Yeah. I, I just want to say on the, on the first, I, if there's a tipping point at some juncture in the future where if London does, substantial parts of London become a theme park and people see it and they react to it, it's too late. That, when the tipping point comes, it will be too late. Uh, and people will then resent and look back and require who did what when. So I'm a great believer in doing things quietly, gently and, and with a degree of proportionality rather than ending up with a reaction and history teaches us I mean you just have to look back at the 20th century where people pushed it to a point where the reaction not just swept them away but swept in other forces I mean this is why for instance the despoiling of the Madonna in Poland I have no truck with the uh, right-wing party that runs Poland uh, and their campaign for the European election, not at all. But you could pay people to do that to get exactly the opposite reaction to the ones do it, wanting to do it. In other words, this is there's a degree of insanity in all this that actually is, is part of our history. Anarcho-syndicalism and people thinking that having a bit of fun or doing something off the cuff actually changes the world is proved to be often a disaster in terms of the cause they espouse. That doesn't, of course, deal with the policing issue uh, and, and how, how we handle it. But I think on the grandmother test, I come back to, uh, we need a much better definition of when you're causing harm. I wouldn't have minded all, all those people who quite, quite rightly thought it was a great, enjoyable moment to highlight climate change being fined on the spot for the cost of clean-up, including the plastic bottles, which many of them brought, by the way. <laughs> um, we are just over time. Um, so if we'll take one more quick question with the men. They have to stretch on, but it has to be a very quick question. Thank you. Just hold on. So I don't know Sorry, if you could just yeah. start again with the mic. It's Danny Shaw from the BBC. Apologies, because I came in late, if you've covered this. But I wondered if in the range of policing tactics that is being considered in the police, um, and with your knowledge, uh, you might know whether this is one of them, whether the deployment of undercover officers to get ahead of the protest group so that you know the police know what they're planning next is likely to be considered, has been considered, and what your thoughts are on that. A nice brief question if we can have brief answers. Anybody want to volunteer? Obviously, there's an undercover um, policing inquiry linked to um, the history of deploying undercover officers on protest. There is not separate legislation around deploying undercover officers on, on um, in different types of crime. It's one set of legislation. Um, it's based on, uh, on serious criminality. So um, deploying undercover officers on um, peaceful protest when there's no intelligence about serious criminality would be illegal. Um, um, deploying it on um, in inverted commas protest groups that are um, planning serious violence, uh, sort of serious damage that would pass a serious criminality threshold, would in principle be legal, and it's a tactic that would be considered. Can, can I just comment as well? I mean, I know a bit about the undercover police inquiries, as you know, but this wasn't a case that needed any undercover policing. The, the protest was out in the open. They got a website saying what their broad plans were, and my understanding is they were liaising regularly in advance with the police saying what they plan to do and so there's no need in terms of intelligence gathering 
to deploy that and in that sense the demonstration and the police response was resource light rather than resource dependent. And I understand that is the case and I'm instinctively against undercover action unless it's been properly warranted and authorised and if Alex were here he would recall his days when he was overseeing as the commissioner um, the kind of warrants that I signed are with great care because it's a dangerous road and a very difficult one. So, you know, I think the other bit of this, surely, is you just need extraordinarily good social media monitoring now. You know, people tell you what they're going to do, even if they haven't gone to the police and told them, mm -hmm. as I think they did in this case. And then you can make a judgment proportionately as to when you intervene and how quickly. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit affected by my history. It's a different issue completely, but I came in as Home Secretary literally on the back of the continuing Bradford riots, and I had to, to back the police in taking absolutely decisive action because people's community was being burnt down. That's completely different to, to the one we're talking about here. But it was a good example of how you needed to give people the support and, and the wherewithal to be able to act quickly before it took off into something that you couldn't control. Thank you very much. I think we are out of time. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming and, and, and our panel. Um, I think, as, uh, as the lady said, it's, uh, it's Judith, um, that uh, this project is all about trying to make sure London continues to ride the quest, uh, crest of the wave. Um, we're not, you know, we're not alarmists, we're not into doom and gloom, but we want to arrest any worrying trends before they, uh, they go too far and reach that tipping point that um, David spoke about. Um, London clearly has come a long way in dealing with protests since the Duke of Wellington put cannon on Westminster Bridge to prevent the Chartists coming across. So I think, you know, we hopefully will continue in that grand sw uh, sweep of progress. If you can all just join Francis me. Francis Wien's book tells me that he succeeded, but there we go. Well, the, apparently the rain succeeded, which we're about yeah. to go and uh, in enjoy ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all very much for coming and if you just join me in thanking our panel oh and please do get in touch if you've got ideas about how to make London more livable